And it's Michigan's Auto Talk podcast. Welcome to episode 63. I'm producer Phil Tower, and we remind you every episode of Michigan's Auto Talk podcast is all about celebrating the automobile, everything automotive. And we're also about helping and supporting you, car and truck owners across our great state of Michigan, birthplace of everything birthplace of everything automotive. Uh, I am joined uh, by the real stars of the podcast, Al Schwinkendorf, John Puick from Verberg's Automotive here in beautiful, sunny, hot Grand Rapids, Michigan, as we record episode 63 here as we kind of wind down the month of July. We're going to be, or June rather, I'm not trying to make summer go too fast. Dan, you're making it shorter, dude. Yeah, tell me about it. We're going to be talking about... (laughs) I'll I'll take it. Come on. (laughs) We're going to be talking about those of you who are going to hit the road. Yeah, you know, $5 gas be damned. I don't think people care that much about it. I I think I see more cars driving now as we still kind of emerge from COVID. There are a lot of people, you know, that finally are like, okay, it's summertime. I'm going to get out of the house. Uh, So we're going to we're going to talk about that. And uh, we also want to tease that we are are going to do a show in the in the future. uh, Maybe a couple more episodes about Ransom E. Olds. Because, first of all, Al really wants to do that show. And secondly, this guy yep. was hugely influential in the entire automobile business at the turn of the 20th century. Um, probably d- did not get his credit and did get his dues like Henry Ford and so many others did. Would, would that be fair to say, Al? That's very fair to say. Yep. Yeah, and I'm, I'm looking yep. forward to talking about yep. that. There is an Oldsmobile uh, Museum in Lansing. And maybe we can even get somebody from the museum on to, to kind of yeah, augment cool. that episode because I well, have heard from several people that is a killer museum. I, it is. And um, I had a great aunt who worked there. And I always thought, being a car guy and being in Grand Rapids, that Oldsmobiles were very popular everywhere. And in the 80s and the mid up to the mid-90s, the most prevalent car we worked on in the shop was an Oldsmobile. And then I find out later when GM shuttles them that um, Michiganders, um, people in Florida who are people from Michigan, <laughs> people in certain areas yep, of Arizona that came from Michigan, um, and some places in California, um, Oldsmobiles were wildly popular. And in the rest of the country, in Canada and that, they were not. And that just that blew my mind because every other car was an Oldsmobile. I mean, I took driver's ed in Oldsmobiles. Oldsmobile, Oldsmobile, that's all we had. And um, it's a great story, and it's really neat. So we're going to do that justice on one episode. Yeah, and... and can we at least um, bow before what was maybe one of the greatest family vehicles of all time? It was the Oldsmobile. Was it the Vista Cruiser, the wagon? Vista Cruiser with the extra sunroof in the back and the <laughs> oh, back man. electric seat. Yep. Man, did GM build a, <laughs> dip, build a beast there or what? That was an incredible Two-way vehicle. Two-way tailgate. It would sink <laughs> down or flip out. Yeah, that was a ride right there. Can we do? Can we just do a show on the Vista Cruiser? I, I would. I those, think we should do a station wagon show. Those were incredible. Yes. We, we had a '69 Ford Country Squire, and it had all those you know features, including oh, yeah. including. Yeah. The, I remember the rear window glass did something unusual yes and of course yep. the seats in the back of that like we talked about when we did the gilmore shows oh, yeah. a couple of weeks ago yep. they were all metal save for a little bit of vinyl in the center where you would sit so you know dad slammed on the brakes your head <laughs> you know you had a dent in your forehead for a while well yeah. back before the days of car seats when i should have been in a car seat um my mom had uh, dad traded in the salmon pink rambler wagon and got a falcon and it had a 289 v8 and a three in the tree and we always always used to tell mom <laughs> to race people when we were at stoplights so she'd just push in the clutch and rev the engine up a little bit and that uh, appeased me i thought it was the coolest thing in the world the baby blue and navy falcon wagon and you know what the the rambler wagon was the coolest because the seats all folded down and you go to the drive-in and dad would back in and fold all the seats down so it was like one huge four by eight bed and we'd all sit there and look out the back and watch the movie in our pajamas yeah on saturday night <laughs> those were the days all right let's let's yes, focus you guys are the pros you see the cars i'm, I'm sure you're seeing it for birds 
right now and have been for several weeks a lot of people who are saying okay check it over we're going to drive across the country or we're going to you know we're going to drive out and uh you know try to see uh yellowstone or what's not flooded uh, out there um a lot of things that get (laughs) easily overlooked triple a has a list of um you know the things you need to do obviously yeah you want to check your tires and all that i mean what do you recommend yeah there's two ways to do that some people do it blindly we have two characters that happen to be customers um one of them (laughs) bought like a early 60s new chrysler newport and where did he get that john oregon or something yeah he 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 went he went out bought the thing (laughs) bought it off you know seeing it on the internet jumped in it put some gas in it and headed back to grand rapids bought a one-way ticket well, a uh, CV joint in the rear drive shaft failed, and so he just went and rented a U-Haul truck and a trailer and loaded it up and brought her on home. Uh, we got another guy that buys really goofy, strange vehicles, and he thinks nothing of going to Arizona or California and buying something. He tries to drive it back, and if it makes it cool, and if it doesn't, well, he stops and gets it fixed, and he goes on. That's not the way we want to go on family vacations. No, and these are probably single yeah. uh, guys or they're divorced, right? It has to be. No, they're nuts. They're, yeah, they're, they're nuts. They're crazy. I love them to death. They are, they're so much fun, but they just, <laughs> they're into the road trip thing. You know, the biggest thing we see, just remember the last time you went on vacation and maybe you went up north or maybe you went over to Chicago or something like that. What do you see on the side of the road? Trailers and cars with flat tires and bearings gone out and stuff like that. Yep. John can tell you, you know, the what is the five things you want to know about your vehicle? Because I know John checks these before he goes down to the in-laws in Ohio. If you're doing a road trip, no, I'm, <laughs> it's cool in the summer. Yeah. yeah. Are you a little bit yeah. anal about that, no, Mr. I, Puick? I get, yes, he is. Okay. Well, I, I get accused of being a little bit of a Boy Scout, but uh, I always make sure that the tires are full. I've got a little battery jump pack just in case the battery fails, even though I've already checked it before I went out there. I make sure the fluids are all full, oil, driveline fluids, coolant. I make sure the belts look good, all my lights are working, and... I also, and this drives my wife crazy because it involves me taking all of her Meyer bags out of the back seat, but I make sure that the spare tire will go all the way down and all the way up. So if we do have something, I can, you know, actually drop it down because so many people think, oh, I got a spare tire, no problem. Coming from a General Motors guy, or a truck guy i should say even the fords dodge whatever in michigan you don't you know think about it and then when you start to unwind that uh, you know the little apparatus that drops the spare tire down all of a sudden okay, very it good point drop. here how and many times binds. in your life have you had a flat tire john phil N- never i've never i don't think i've ever had a flat tire I've had two it. occasions where I had to stop. Well, there was three, but what that was from the first one was a burnout competition, which I won because the tire. Blew I was going to so say, yeah, if, if there, there's, I, there's more. I'm, there, I'm talking yeah, about there's cruising more down to the it. road, um, having a flat here. and have to get out and change it. And I've had two instances of that, and they were about 25 years apart. But that is a very, very good point. And the biggest thing is <clears throat> that's one of those things on vehicles that pretty much the hoist and the lock assembly is the same whether you're ford ram or gm there there's a lock they put on the hole where you stick the wrench in to lower the tire those things eat dirt and salt and car wash water and they never work so you need to put some wd-40 in there put your key in there and take that thing in and out once a month yeah and it's probably a good idea three four times a year to get the tool bag out lower the tire like john said down to the ground Mm -hmm. spray that cable and everything spray the snot out of it with like wd-40 or pv blaster or something like that and crank it back up because the only thing i take that back i've had four flat tires before in one one of them, the one, the fourth one that I forgot about wasn't my vehicle, but uh, because I was driving. Um, <clears throat> not only did I have to go in and cut and fight to get the tire out, when I got the tire out, I found out it was flat. Yeah, Spare tires. Exactly, yeah. You, if you're well, not driving then, uh, yep. Infinity or a Lexus, um, your tire pressure monitor is not covering the spare tire, so you need to manually check that make sure it's okay. And like John said, just lower that thing down and, and make sure you can actually use it if you need to. 
Plus, the way they hide some of the jacks and stuff nowadays, it's probably a good idea to get yourself orientated oh, with yeah. that. So if you do have something on the side <laughs> of the road, it doesn't take you all day to do it. Well, I was going to say, I am used to going up north where you go through the Sini Flats where there's, you know, a couple hours of two-lane driving where there's no one. Now, maybe if I were to go to Lansing or in a more populated area, I might not be as cautious or paranoid of you know making sure everything is is working you know because there's people around and i can call triple a but i can tell you right now <laughs> once you're up past germ fast the cell phone coverage is dead and if you're on the side of two and you're done so you best make sure you know what being you got a young on. and unlike phil and i and having your kids be so young the other thing that you're not thinking of is even though you have the cell phones nowadays and you can call for help most likely and get that taken care of the stress remember how stressed out your dad used to be on family vacations in the car yep here here's my deal <laughs> we're going on vacation i know this is gonna cost just a buttload load of money and then three hundred and fifty dollars for a wrecker bill and a new tire or maybe five or six or eight hundred bucks to do that just goes into the freaking account right there i mean you talk about stress check out your car ahead yeah. of time it's worth it yeah and i want to i want to also we're talking about you know these cars with uh, flat tires and other issues you know axles that break whatever this time of year i see more and more people with you know, steam and smoke coming out of the front end. They've overheated. And I'm going to tell you, I'm sure both of you guys know this. I would bet 99 out of 100 people do not know how to check their coolant in the car. They have no clue. That's correct. And the biggest problem there is, yep. too, we get, and I think John will agree, we get these pressurized systems. And it's getting better because now most of the reservoirs are pressure. They're part of the pressure system. But if um, you get a vehicle that has a cap that's just kind of, it's not sealed, it's not a spin-on cap or anything like that where the reservoir is, that can be full. And it can look like you're full of fluid. But if you have a coolant leak, it means the radiator can't push excess in there and suck excess out of there so the radiator can be half empty and the reservoir can look just fine and luckily we're mm -hmm. you know they're getting away from that they're pressurizing the what they, what they call them degas bottles and De so yeah, we can look bottles. and we can actually see what's there and a lot of cars have a sensor where it will light up on the dash if it's low but you're exactly right i don't think uh, a lot of people can't um tell what their coolant level is and i'm surprised at how many people stop in when they have you know it's been three thousand four thousand miles since their oil change the light came on said they needed some oil and you say okay give me the keys i'm gonna park the car on a flat surface and shut it off and you have to wait five minutes to go push a button because there's no dipstick and that's where yeah. auto service comes into play transmissions no dipstick i mean i think the biggest thing next to flat tires the um state of michigan said uh failures on 131 in the summertime is transmission failures and who knows yep. and here's the deal if you go in and get an oil change the process you have to go through to check the transmission fluid a lot of times it's never getting checked so if you're told on a boat or a camper or something like that and you don't have a dipstick on your transmission next time you get an oil change or you're in for some service say i want you to check my transmission fluid level expect to pay for it if you don't have a dipstick but it's worth it that's a very good point point. and another yeah. one nobody really thinks about is belts uh you know the the, the belts for the water mm -hmm. pump or, or this belt or that bump belt they they don't think about them. Uh, they're they're kind of out of sight, out of mind. They can check a fluid, um, you know. Let alone you know, not knowing how to do the the coolant in the radiator. You should ask somebody to check a belt. But can the average Jane or Joe at home check well, a belt? I think they can, but uh, you know, for a little bit, and they they still use them despite every mechanical being in my body. Everybody I've ever talked to, despite engineers the stretch fit the stretch fit belts they they try to go you know everybody used to think okay well if the belt goes bad when it starts making noise squeak 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 okay that, i need a belt or maybe the tensioner but now you have the stretch fit belts and you could have multiple belts on systems we've had since 
I can't remember how far back. I'd say early 2000s. Correct me if I'm wrong, Al, but Toyotas, Hondas, they had a power steering belt, and yeah. then they had yeah. the alternator AC water pump belt, and those were two separate belts, and you wouldn't get anything until they started maybe making noise, but by that time they were so cracked and worn that they just, you, you can't, you couldn't do anything with them. And with the stretch fit belts that unfortunately we're starting to see a little bit more. I know in my wife's 2018 Tahoe, she's got one for the power steering or uh, for the AC, I should say. Um, I know some of the Fords have them for the uh, the ones that don't have electronic power steering. They've got them for the power steering, but there's not that noise that you can hear anymore. So you do need to go down there and take a look and see if it's cracked. And unfortunately, because the way everybody is manufacturing manufacturing engines it's very hard to see these belts so it's much more a time related just like you do your oil change if it says and is recommended at x amount of miles check and change your belts you need to do that because they it's not a good and go it just pops and boom and you're done and all of a sudden yeah, hey, my battery light is coming on and now my power steering is getting a little weaker because a lot of cars have electronic power steering and once the alternator can't put out that because it's not spinning it's got no juice so everything starts going and all of a sudden your dash turns on like a christmas tree so it is much more of a there's no squeak it's all of a sudden right. poof, and you're you know done. that and you don't want to be being stuck said you know we're going away from v-belts pretty much almost everything right now is a what they call it a v-rib belt it's a serpentine wide flat mm -hmm. belt you know it's got x amount of grooves depending on how much horsepower it needs to move power steering a air conditioning all that kind of crap and they did that to um, make better room in the engine compartment you don't have to stagger pulleys we used to have mm -hmm. general motors cars with air pumps back in the 80s that had five different belts on them <laughs> and now they do it with either one or two yeah. and the stretch fit belt john's talking about doesn't have that spring-loaded tensioner where you can you know maybe lose a finger but you can put a new belt on it on the side of the road and get it going those <laughs> things you have to have a special tool that doesn't work and you you yep. actually you literally take this belt and you turn it and turn it and turn it and you have this little thing that forces it over and you stretch it out and you're relying on it shrinking back so think of a rubber band and the the the, the messed up yeah the the messed up part and this is in every manufacturer i've seen to remove the belt it's literally cut says it. yeah cut it you take a knife and because you because the cut tool it. doesn't there's work there's no like oh release yeah. The, yeah exactly you just you cut it so that tells you if they're saying you need to literally cut the belt off what do you think it is going to take to put that thing on. well they're so they're think about that for a little bit. tensioner and they're saving some money and and that's how you know again i say it a million times manufacturers think that you walk into a dealership you buy a new car you drive it for 4.8 years you cut it up in little pieces and throw it in the trash and you go back you get a uber to the dealership and you buy your next new car and uh, here's the thing the serpentine belts um it's funny because for years and years uh, there's been all this debate on how many cracks per inch you could have before you have to get rid of it. They're really solid. <laughs> they last a long time if they don't get fluids on them and stuff like that. And just because they're cracked and the guy at the oil change place says you need to replace it, that's not necessarily the case. If you're missing pieces or it's wearing deep into it, that's another situation. But cracks don't necessarily mean anything because they're going around tight diameters and it's a whole mm -hmm. big it's it's a whole big thing and we're kind of getting away from it and the industry is kind of going back to one single serpentine with a spring-loaded tensioner there's some european stuff that's really wacky it's got two pulleys on one tensioner and it's freaking insane but Mm -hmm. belts are better than they ever were and so nobody checks them anymore so they become a bigger problem if you know what i mean even though they're better it, it becomes a yeah. bigger problem yep. because everybody just assumes yeah. that they're fine for 200 it ignores minutes. it yep yeah okay perfect segue yep. now, i do i do got one question yeah go ahead john hold on real quick phil this this will be interesting i got a question for al what are your thoughts on gator belts 
because a lot of times those when you're on the side of a gas station or there's just a quick little place everybody sells the gator belts what are your thoughts on those i have my own well i haven't seen them in a while and it was basically goodyear trying to make a product that they could sell for the 5.7 liter gmc vehicles that had squeaky belts they cut they put a cut in the back so it would take air in there underneath between it and the pulley the thing with the serpentine belt is you have either a pulley that has grooves or you have pressure on the back side where it's smooth and the gator back on the back that was smooth they cut these little sipes into it and look kind of look like a tire and mm-hmm. the idea was that even if you still didn't fix your tensioner issue or pulley issue or whatever that was causing the noise yeah. it would make it quiet and they sold the crap out of them yep. and it was great i think it was a marketing ploy that's just me so what is a gator belt real gotcha. quickly i think the a goodyear gator back a gator belt if you look at the serpentine belt they have what four five or six ribs on the on the bottom side give or take and then the back yep. side is smooth yep. and what they do is they normally have a smooth idler pulley that puts tension on that back smooth side to keep the belt tight it's just a spring-loaded device and so there was mm-hmm. a time when you know if somebody had a 5.7 a 350 chevy suburban from 1999 and they said oh change the oil and the belt squeak and you go what are we going to do it's a 1999 5.7 the belt's going to squeak that's how they are goodyear designed mm-hmm. this gator back with these sipes cut in it and it would take air underneath there and it would prevent it from making the chirping noise that it made when it slapped against the smooth pulley you know, and now I, I can remember going to a continental Ooh, class the enemy and yeah. yeah exactly yeah exactly and they were talking about that and they said basically the the, the modern ones where they not only cut them on the back but yep. they cut them on the front where the grooves are they call it a self aligning <laughs> belt so when your pulley is starting to yeah. walk out it, it, it exactly it, it'll, it'll keep it quiet and so I can remember asking the guy that was teaching I'm like so you're saying when your pulley is going to fail instead of making it a noise you want the belt to make it quiet so when the pulley finally you're goes screwed. it just yeah. goes wouldn't wouldn't you rather have the noise so then hey something's going on versus everything is fine and then bam you're done so again it's all that's, about that's sales kind of one of those it's all about uh, sales did they exactly yeah ex- exactly but that's did they truly say that's a self-aligning belt Yes, it, it's a self-aligning belt because not only do you have the grooves that go in right. the front that go on the groove pulleys, so they have move. grooves that go on the back. Yeah. Exactly. And I was just sitting there, I'm like, well, you know, I don't know if I agree with this, but, the, you know, well, you're paying for my dinner, so I'll listen and <laughs> you tell me whatever you want, the, but I don't, I'm not buying what you're the selling. The biggest problem with serpentine belts is they need to be aligned perfectly. Because if they're not, mm-hmm. even if they don't make noise, if you put a gator back on there and it's quiet, it's going to chew up the belt because they mm-hmm. have to run in a track. And that's where yeah. a V-belt didn't matter because you could have flex in between them and it was taken up in a pulley. So that's a whole nother show, just so yeah. you know, Phil. Yeah, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm but sure it is. Needs to Take be it away. Okay, so here's the mm-hmm. thing, the last thing that, uh, speaking of, people because of technology aren't even going to think about until it goes out um and i I want to make this real quick because we're running out of time ac your ac is working great and you get 200 miles into the trip and it gives out i mean i mean there's a there's no way to prevent that other than having a technician like you guys check it ahead of time right or am i wrong AC is weird because you can john and i can hook up a machine to your vehicle look at the pressures kind of look around and say okay it's 89 degrees out and it's humid as heck and your low sides at 40 and your high sides at 245 that's pretty good you know it's not textbook perfect mm-hmm. but the the problem with ac is pressures change with humidity and temperature um you can't the only way to totally say your ac is good is to extract the um, free on charge out of it 
measure it, say, okay, your car was charged at the factory with 1.7 pounds of R134A. We pulled out 1.4 pounds, put 1.7 back in it with some dye, which kind of skews the pressure if you want to get nitty gritty, and then have you run it and see that, mm -hmm. you know, maybe you've got a slow leak. Um, it is so rare for us to fill up an AC system where it just blasts out, but we had an instance just last week. AC was dead. It was an afterthought for the guy after we did some other repairs on the Land Rover. Charge the thing up. As the thing is charging, we hear pssss, and John puts it up in the air and goes, oh, this line's got a hole in it. In that instance, um, rear AC is a huge problem with everything. It was, like, smarter to just block it off and do the front AC instead of spending $1,500 to get new lines to the back. And then we charged the thing up, and guess what? The, the compressor's not running. So he had a leak, and then he had something else fail from not being used for God only knows how many years. Um, you know, yeah. so we look <laughs> yeah. bad, but it's just like oh, we can't even put gas in it because it leaks right out, so we can't get enough gas into it to make the pressure sensors happy to run the compressor. Yeah, if your AC is weak, you know, have it checked out. Um, there's we have a lot of customers who have leaks that we know about things yeah. like evaporators that are in the dashboard that might cost twenty five hundred dollars to repair and we can fill them up and they can go like six months and everything's okay um, mm -hmm. we have some that you know it leaks so fast it's not even worth charging up we just suck the gas back out but that's back to your relationship with your mechanic and and what's what but for a lot of people, we, I don't know, Jim, what do we got, 50, 40, 50 people that we just charge up and, and let them go by? Some people we need to charge up twice a year, so, yep. and we know the vehicle and everything else, but it's yep. just like you're going to charge it up at the end of May, you're going to charge it up the 1st of August, and then and let it leak out through the winter and come see us next May because we can do that for the next five years, and it's cheaper than fixing your issue. Yeah, that's a good point, and, and that yeah. is a practical well, and, and way also, to do it. Well, and we also see certain times, too, where we've got people that, well, the AC works fine up here in Michigan, and then let's say they are snowbirds and they Those go are down the ones south that get us, and yeah. they're stuck in Ad Exactly. They're, they're stuck in uh, Atlanta on the, you know, I don't know, highway or whatever, and they're sitting not going anywhere 90 degrees and all of a sudden it doesn't start blowing super cold anymore because it just it the system can't do it so there's there's a lot of you know um what kind of driving what what kind of setup are you doing are you hanging up in the up or are you going downtown sitting idling in atlanta you know it, it systems aren't made to work in 100 plus degrees i don't care r134 yf25 l by whatever it just it it can't cool that simple as that so you know we see that where where they, they they come back like oh in florida it was really it wasn't really blowing right. all that cold and they come back up here well now it's really good ever since i got past you know ohio it was really great it's yeah like, well, ac okay. fights humidity really well it fights temperatures very badly mm -hmm. the, we see a lot of vehicles get not now but like four or five years ago that would get sold off because of ac issues and it, it's mm -hmm. very very expensive um like everything else in the automobile they're making it lighter and lighter it used to be when we put block off kits on the rear of a suburban um there was like an eighth inch thickness to the aluminum tubes that went back there now it's less than a 16th yep. i mean every you know they make it lighter mm -hmm. cheaper this that everything else and this um what is it why one two three four five f a f or whatever the new stuff is yep yep we're talking like that quadru so quadruple the price so yeah um Yep. The leak detection equipment is outrageous. The charging equipment is outrageous. I mean, Sean, our our cohort and friend, he has the equipment on his van to evacuate and recharge one of those systems, and it costs three hundred and fifty bucks plus the gas. Wow, three hundred and fifty dollars yeah. plus the gas. So. 
So it's it's not just like a hey, fill it up and then come back when it stops and we'll charge you another like, five hundred. No, yeah, no, no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not gonna happen. Real but, quickly, what vehicles are those I, so we can avoid too, them? Though, the, the, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just about anything high end, right? I'm no. guessing. Oh no, it's uh, everything. It, 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 it's getting everywhere, but at, at least uh, a lot of them are getting very advanced in terms of uh, leak detection and capabilities. And it's not just a uh, oh system drop pressure. There might be a, a compressor lockout. It's no my expansion valve or my orifice True. tube is dropping. You got the or, computer or along those it, lines. Yeah. So exactly, it's every, every everything is seeing it because I can you know also when you used to have the uh, evaporators ice up and you know oh I had a full system but it's because I've been running it for so long my evaporators iced up and it's not blowing anymore well now we have little intake air temp sensors intake evap uh, evaporator core sensors that can register and, and see all that stuff so it gives you kind of a point of view or it gives you a, a, a place to at least look at because you're not gonna start hucking hundreds of dollars at just guessing oh let's fill it up yeah and see. things are no that, that doesn't work you know anymore. phil you you started yep. this you asked us to talk about it and every time you do that i know you pay the price so i need like a minute and a half here for a really quick something we're going to do new it's going to be this week in automotive history okay go ahead and we'll wrap it up june 22nd 2001 was the first release of the the Fast and Furious series. That thing, I've never watched. One of the best I've ones. I've never watched it, but to date they've ranked in $5.8 oh, yeah. billion dollars, and they're like the 10th highest grossing film series ever. Um, I made my dad up north drop me off at the movie theater <laughs> so I could watch the first right, one. Right, you're... You were exactly who they were aiming for. That is in incredible. It's that old. I can't. I didn't even know it was 21 yeah, exactly. years old. Uh, in 1903, a guy named Tom Fetch got sponsored by Packard to drive um, this old. It's 1903, so vehicles were horse-drawn wagons with engines in them. He went from San Francisco to New York in a Packard. Um, it took him 63 days. He hated every moment of it when they were done, but he did it, and he was the second guy to go coast to coast, so that was cool. Um, 19, nice. June 19th, 1966, Ford went 123 at Le Mans in the GT40s, so Ford and Ferrari, if you've seen that movie, yep. that's when it happened. Oh, yeah. And in June 18th, 1923, the first checker was built in Kalamazoo. And that's that's another one that we need to coordinate with the people down at Gilmore and talk about the checkers because you talk about a um, Michigan-made, underrated vehicle that even though it was uh, rude, crude, and everything else, they sold zillions of them and did a really good job. It's, it's so iconic. What was that? What was that, Danny? To, uh, what, Taxi. You know the sitcom. Yeah. There we go, the yeah. taxi. Yeah. Surprise. But yeah, I mean, it, it's so iconic. Oh, no, it is. It is. Um, I, we my... had a customer in the 80s who actually, he was the owner of a huge business in town. He was a partial owner of the Detroit Pistons. And for Christmas, he bought his wife a yellow checker. It was an extended body with opera windows in the back, and it was a 4.3 Chevy V6 with a 350 turbo hydromatic. It was a turd with a bunch of leather in it and stuff like that, and she drove her kids to Forest Hill Central every day in that thing, <laughs> and it was freaking hilarious. That's awesome. And that was the exact same <laughs> car they built in 1963, but it was a 1984 model or something like that. <laughs> Checkers, uh, another whole nice. episode in the story. Sorry, Phil, we'll shut up now. <laughs> yeah, I we could definitely yeah. do an entire show on Checker alone, and you can still buy them. They're still out there. Uh, that is yep. going to put the wraps on episode number 63. Don't forget, love us on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash Michigan's Auto Talk. Share the podcast with a friend. Tell a friend. Uh, send us, you know, uh, 
any form of currency, $20 and above in the mail. We welcome <laughs> that. And uh, until next time, I'm producer <laughs> and jack of all trades, Phil Tower. I'm Al I'm John Buick. Thanks for listening. <laughs>